All right, welcome to our lecture on states, nations, and nation states. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at the impacts of culture on political geography. The slides were designed by a gentleman named David Palmer, and my name is, of course, Chris Gall, and I'll be your host for the lecture today. <clears throat> so we're talking about political geography. We've got a few essential concepts, and we're only going to go over some of these today, but um, there's some pretty important ones. And the first thing I want to do is talk about definitions of states and nations because a lot of times here in the United States in particular in uh, common speech we use these two interchangeably but they're not actually the same thing okay so when we talk about states what we're talking about are political units and every time you read the word state or you hear the word state we're talking about and we're in this unit in particular and uh, we're not talking about some place like the United States or maybe India or Mexico. Um, every time you see that word state, I want you to hear country because that's really the way that we use it. Okay? Political geographers say and political uh, scientists use that word state and what they're really talking about are what you and I call countries. Okay, so um, states are political units. They have governments. In particular, states share a few key characteristics. One is that they're, they have defined boundaries. Okay, that means that you can look at a map and you can draw lines around where they are. Two is that they're internationally recognized. And that means that other countries say, yeah, you're a state. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're a country. And three, is that they've got sovereignty over the land and over the people within their boundaries. And sovereignty, remember, is that idea of control. It's the ability to make laws and rules over the land, over the people within boundaries. And a lot of people include a fourth characteristic that's kind of related to that third one, which is to say that you have to have a defined population. Okay. Now, there are some gray areas when we're talking about these things. For example, colonies oftentimes will have some of these characteristics, but not all of them. For instance, colonies often have defined boundaries. They may be um, more or less sovereign over their own land, but they may not be internationally recognized, for example. Um, there's also the issue of new countries or, con or um, groups that are trying to break away from a country. So that would be another gray area because they've got, generally speaking, a defined boundary and kind of draw a line around where they think their boundaries ought to be. Oftentimes they've got some kind of sovereignty over the land and there's a defined population, but they may not be internationally recognized. right? Or they may be internationally recognized by only a handful of countries. So there's a little bit of gray area and there's some fudging that goes on with this. Nations, on the other hand, are cultural units. Okay, nations are generally speaking based around ethnic identity. And we haven't talked so far a lot about culture and ethnicity, but let me give you just some real basics. When we're talking about ethnic identity, we're talking about some kind of a common ancestry. This can be either mythical or actual common ancestry. Right? Typically, there's some kind of a common religion and or language. Not always, but most often. And there are definitely accepted ways of behavior. Okay, so... There are ways that we behave that they don't. That's in group outgroup group kind of stuff is very key to ethnic identity. Um, another key point about a nation is that they have political aspirations. Okay, so that means they either are or want to be self-controlled. Okay, they want that that sovereignty or they have that sovereignty. Last but not least is we're talking about about groups of people that have homelands. Okay, where we can point to on a map and we can say that's where they come from, that's where they are. Right? It's kind of that sacred soil idea. Okay, it's where we come from. It's where our roots are. So, along with that, then we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about nationalism. Right? And nationalism can take several forms. And you'll be able to kind of see the similarities here. Right? We talk about ethnic nationalism, which is pride of nation based on group identification with a specific culture, right? This is where you might talk about um, being, say, Cuban-American, right? So you've got that pride of nation based on that group identification. 
And then there's also civic nationalism, which is, is different. Civic nationalism is pride based on, of nation based on a government system or political ideals that transcend ethnicity. So when we say transcend, that means it goes above and beyond ethnicity. Okay, so for example, here in the United States, one of the ways we exhibit our civic nationalism, especially at, at our high schools, we say the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning, right? And that's a way of showing our, our pride in our nation. And it's based on that, that government system. Okay, and these two questions, you don't need to write them down, but they are things to kind of think about as we're going through and as we're talking about stuff today, but then also just as we're going through the unit more broadly. All right, so how do multi-ethnic or multi-nation states promote a sense of national identity? Okay, so how do they promote that broader identity that allows them to become a country? Okay, and then with that, right, is there a downside with fostering national? Just some things to think about, because these have, historically these have raised issues, right? Either not having enough national identity or having too much. <clears throat> so, moving on, we're going to pull back and look some more at some definitions and some of the geography that goes with this idea of nations and states. Okay, and these are all, by the way, things that you need to know. Okay, so situation number one, which is kind of the historical ideal, particularly coming out of Europe, is the idea of the nation-state model. And that is a close match between political sovereignty, so governmental control, and the extent of a nation's homeland, or that area where they can identify as being our space. All right, so our, our next situation is a multi-nation state. So that means we've got a political unit that's got two or more national homelands within it. Okay, so um, for example, a lot of a lot of states in Africa fall into this, or a lot of European states fall into this, right? And these um, can lead to ethno-nationalism, okay, which we talked about with the last slide. And if they're not well managed, ultimately to uh, stages of political fragmentation. And fragmentation is just a fancy way of saying that things start to fall apart. Okay? Ultimately, you see separatism, right, which are these movements to create a separate country. Devolution, which is when power gets taken away from kind of the central government, or um, in the U.S. we call it the federal government, and gets spread out to the various regions. Right, so they control more of their own destiny. And then at its very extreme end, political fragmentation leads to secession, which is really a fancy way of saying that part of the country may choose to leave and to um, create its own country. Right. Situation three is our multi-state nation, which means we've got a cultural unit, right, a homeland, that exists across the boundaries of more than one political unit. So this might lead to what's called irredentism, which is that political goal to unify a nation across existing state borders. Okay. And by the way, I'll give examples of all these after I finish kind of providing definition. Uh, our last situation, when we talk about the geography of nations and states, is what's called a stateless nation. Okay. And a stateless nation is a, a nation, a cultural group that's got political aspirations but that what they don't have is control. They don't have sovereignty over their, their homeland. Okay, So let me just go ahead and I'm going to give you some examples of these things to help you kind of firm things up in your brain. So with situation one, what we've got is, again, the nation state model. And the classic example of this, probably one of the best examples of this, is Japan. And in Japan, if you look at the demographic number, something like 95 percent or more of Japan is ethnically Japanese, okay? And most Japanese people in the world live in Japan. So there's a close match between the extent of the homeland, the Japanese islands, right, and political sovereignty or that control. Situation two, our multi-nation state, again, we see a lot of these in Africa, we see a lot of these in Europe, in particular in Eastern Europe is really where we see a lot of these. Okay, um, but the classic examples, right, the great examples with good modern 
um, things that we talk about, we talk about the United Kingdom and we talk about Spain. Okay, and in the United Kingdom, what we've seen happen actually within the last year or so is Scotland held a referendum, which is a fancy way of saying an advisory vote, on whether or not they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, because the formal name of the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Britain, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Maybe not exactly in that order, but at any rate, they held a vote to say, do we want to be in or do we want to be out? Ultimately, they decided to stay in, and part of what helped nudge them to stay in was that London, which is the central government in the United Kingdom, said, we'll give you more power, we'll give you more control, right, we'll make sure that you've got more say, more sovereignty over what, over Scottish affairs, right, and what's been going on in the United Kingdom is slowly but surely each of those individual regions is getting more and more power, and even within Britain itself, individual regions are getting more and more power, so we're seeing that, that devolution. Right. Another great example of this is Spain, and what's going on in Spain right now is you've got the Catalans who live kind of up by the the border of France, kind of in that um, northwestern corner, if I'm remembering my Spanish geography correctly, who historically have, they have their own language, they have their own culture, um, and they've contributed a lot in terms of Spanish GDP, and they've been pushing there's a big separatist movement there, and they've been pushing to secede, and so, or at a minimum, to see some devolution from the Spanish parliament in, in Madrid, right? So those are great modern examples. Situation three with the multi-state nation, right? The classic examples of this are groups like the, um, the Kurds would be a great example, Russians would be a great example, and the crazy part about about Russia, right? So during the USSR period, what the what the government there encouraged ethnic Russians to do was to move into various areas of Eastern Europe to help homogenize the culture and Rus Russicize? I don't know. Anyway, to Russianize the culture, right? So if you're at all familiar with what's been going on in Ukraine, then you know that irredentism is has been Vladimir Putin's excuse for interfering in Ukrainian affairs, is that he's protecting the ethnic Russians. Whether you agree with him or not is a wholly separate issue. But that's what he's been using. The classic historical example is Hitler and Nazi Germany, and Hitler's argument for invading across Eastern Europe was that he was protecting ethnic Germans. Right, situation for the stateless nation, really the classic example, the one that most people use and most books use, are the Kurds. And the Kurds are an ethnic group with a homeland that actually spans four or five separate countries. Right, so they're in Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey. Okay, and they've, it's actually a fairly big sized homeland, and they have their own culture, they have their own language. What they don't have is control over their own homeland, and they've been fighting in each of those areas to try and develop control over the, in each of those countries to develop control over the homeland with varying degrees of success, being fairly successful in Iraq, for instance, and having their own autonomous region, to um, literally being bombed in Syria and in Turkey, having to fight with the national army. So very, very different situations. Before we wrap up, I just want to go ahead and look at, and this is our last slide, we take a quick look, um, and we talk about major empires. So what we see on the top left there is the um, Ottoman Empire, right? And you can see where it kind of goes through much of the modern Middle East and the way it was split up after the First World War and see where the different colonial powers kind of slowly but surely started to establish or European colonizers started to establish control starting before the war and ultimately kind of where they established zones of control afterward. But if you contrast that then with the map on the uh, lower right, what we see are major linguistic groups and um, you can see how there's really no match at all between where countries are or even where colonies were and the major linguistic group. So if you have any questions, please feel free to come see me. I'm sorry I don't have time to summarize, and I will see you the next time we meet.